Welcome to the Capital Forum's seventh annual antitrust thought leadership interview series sponsored by KL Discovery. My name is Jed Goldfarb, and I'm joined today here uh, by Franco Castelli of Wachtell Lipton. Uh, Franco, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your view on the recent attempt by the DOJ to block AT&T's acquisition of Time Warner, in particular whether you think DOJ's stance was uh, politics or policy driven? First of all, thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, it's obviously a difficult question <laughs> that you're asking. I think, um, you know, the DOJ case on a very basic um, antitrust level was, you know, was not uh, earth shattering in terms of the antitrust theory and um, the theory of harm. Um, I think it was generally pretty similar to what we saw in the Comcast NBCU deal in 2011. Um, you know, pretty typical theory of um, raising rivals' costs. You know, you control some critical input at the upstream level that you sell to your downstream competitors. And once you are integrated, vertically integrated, you can uh, charge higher prices to your downstream competitors because any lost sales will be made up by you know capturing your competitors downstream customers and the theory was you know pretty much the same here um, in the AT&T case um, so I don't think it was um, a very you know a novel theory or something that surprised anyone at the you know basic antitrust level what surprised most people was the fact that they sued um, you know ver most vertical uh, well, actually, all vertical cases in the past 40 years have been settled, um, typically with uh, conduct remedies. Um, and that's what happened in the Comcast NBCU deal in 2011. So most people were expecting the same outcome in the AT&T case. Um, but but um, as we know, um, the Assistant Attorney General, um, Del Rahim, is opposed to conduct remedies and so he insisted and the DOJ leadership insisted on um, structural remedies on divestitures divestiture of very significant assets from AT&T you know the Turner networks for example or CNN uh, you know which were very critical to yes. the deal and so if you take that position and there were rumors that the DOJ was concerned that the behavioral remedies in Comcast were not very effective. If you take that position, then really you don't have much of a choice. You know, it's kind of an alternative. You let the deal go through without any remedies, or 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 you sue. And so I think you know um, it might have been a close call. I don't know because I wasn't involved in the deal. But uh, but I think if it was a close call, and it's possible that it was, that may be where um, you know political considerations may have played a role. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the DOJ leadership doesn't live in a bubble. They know what's going on in the world and what the president thinks about issues. And the president was very clear <laughs> about his position on this transaction. Um, and so, again, if it was a close call, I think it's possible that political considerations may have tipped the balance in favor of, of a lawsuit. Great. Right. I mean, in, in that case, uh, I think Trump came out immediately and said that he was against transactions. So you say. I don't want you to generalize across all administrations, but within this administration, do you think that that's an issue going forward that to the extent Trump, you know, expresses a view, yay or nay, on a, on a proposed deal, do you think that's more likely than not to lead the, you know, the reviewing agency to give it more scrutiny? Look, I think the big difference here is that we have a president who's not shy about expressing his views on specific companies, specific tr transactions, which, you know, was not the case with, uh, with prior administrations. In terms of whether the antitrust enforcement system remains largely immune from political pressure, I don't think we're seeing a sea change. Again, uh, it may be the case that in some close calls there may be political considerations, but uh, but you know at this point I don't think we have sufficient evidence to say that um, the president is playing a role in the decision making process at the DOJ or, or FTC. Okay, and and putting politics aside for the moment, do you think that um, the DOJ stance towards the AT&T Time Warner deal? suggests a different posture towards vertical mergers going forward? 
I think so. I mean, obviously, the fact that um, they brought a lawsuit for the first year, first time in 40 years, it's it's a significant sign that they they uh, may be willing to be more aggressive with respect to vertical mergers. I think we've seen more scrutiny at the FTC as well. Um, in particular, there have been two recent cases where uh, commissioners Slaughter and Chopra dissented from the majority in vertical uh, cases, the Staple um, Ascendant case and the uh, Fresenius um, Next Stage case. So I would expect more scrutiny going forward, um, both at the DOJ and FTC of, of uh, vertical deals. Now, whether that um, results in more aggressive enforcement, you know, obviously that's a more difficult question because, um, you know, obviously the agencies don't have the last word in, uh, in the U.S. Um, right. And, you know, at the FTC, we've seen the agency still receptive to uh, behavioral remedies. So you can see some continuity in terms of, of enforcement um, um, in the area of vertical mergers. Um, at the DOJ, it's harder to predict what they will do because if if they no longer have the option of behavioral remedies because they're taking the position that you know that's fundamentally regulatory in nature and the DOJ is an enforcement agency and shouldn't try to you know regulate industries, uh, then if there's a, a, a problematic vertical merger. You are again. You're left with a choice between no enforcement or um, or a lawsuit, unless the parties are willing to agree to divestitures, as was the case, for example, in the Bayer Monsanto deal. But you know, it's often the case that the parties are not willing to agree to divestitures. So um, it's it's hard to tell what will happen at the DOJ. It's possible that they may have to adjust their view on behavioral remedies going forward, also because in the AT&T case. The court did look at the um, baseball-style arbitration commitment that was offered by Time Warner. Um, they define it as um, extra icing on a cake already frosted, and they said, you know, the court said um, it's got to have some some real-world consequences, and so it's difficult going forward for the DOJ to ignore a type of remedy that courts have, you know given credit to. Right. So um, they may have to somewhat adjust their view on, on behavioral remedies going forward. And, and if not, again, it's going to be a tough choice in many cases between no enforcement and, and litigation. Right. And from the perspective of the enforcement, just like DOJ, I mean, obviously, many factors go into decision uh, whether to sue or block a deal or not, right? One of them, allocation of resources, right? Where are you going to spend your time? They can't sue. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> another another, another yeah. one is is probably you know not wanting to have adverse precedent set, right? So here they've just you know got a big black eye with losing Time Warner and the appeal, right? Um, how does that play out going forward? I mean, is that you know one side you can look at that and say, oh well, uh, they don't want to lose again, but they've already lost one. I mean, why not keep trying? What do you have to lose at that point? How, how do you yeah. do it? Yeah, well, which, which, which first, way does that yeah, first of all, there, there's an, um, an, an issue with allocation of resources. You can't put too many of, you know, there's limited resources and there's, you know, important horizontal mergers. There's important other stuff uh, beyond mergers. So they can't just like pivot to uh, prosecuting or litigating all uh, vertical mergers going forward. Um, and then, and then, of course, you know they'll be more careful in terms of creating bad, bad precedent. I mean, you know, one one bad, bad precedent <laughs> is, or you know, a unhelpful uh, precedent is 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 enough. And so, I think they'll be more careful in picking their their cases. But, but do you think from the from the decision and the outcome in the Time Warner case, do you think that there are precedential value that is going to hurt? Is going to you know hamstring DOJ going forward. I mean, or was that so fact specific that it's not going to really? Well, look, it was fact specific, but I think um, I think there are some lessons for the DOJ going forward. Um, you know, vertical cases are much more difficult to litigate because you don't have you know the presumption based on market shares, um, all of the internal documents discussing competition. You know, it's it's much more difficult for DOJ. They relied very heavily on a very complex economic model. Um, and, you know, the court basically said, um, 
you know, first of all, there were issues with that specific model, but basically said, you know, this is more art than science, and the predictive ability of this model is is questionable. And so for the DOJ to uh, rely so heavily on an economic model, you know, that's going to be an issue going forward. Um, and then also, I think another lesson is relying heavily on what customers say, which in a vertical merger, you know, happen to be competitors also. Um, and in particular, on mere speculation, customers saying, yes, if this merger goes through, we will be harmed. But without any supporting evidence for that, you know, that's another important lesson for DOJ. That's not going to be enough with, with the court. And so, you know, the evidentiary burden on the DOJ is probably, you know, higher than what they expected. And I think that's going to be a lesson, um, a lesson going forward. Right. Okay, let's shift uh, for a moment on to um, antitrust as it's impacting the large tech firms out there. Uh, we've seen some uh, increased scrutiny in recent months, including the FTC task force recently set up um, to investigate the large tech firms and um, another fine against Google levied in Europe. Um, where do you see this going? So, um, you know, obviously there's tremendous pressure on the U.S. agencies to um, appear more proactive in the uh, high-tech industry. Um, I, I don't subscribe to the view that uh, there was lax enforcement in the past, but obviously there is um, a, a view or uh, calls from Capitol Hill and pressure from Capitol Hill on the agencies in terms of doing more. Um, there is a um, perception uh, that um, some of the big uh, tech companies have become too dominant, and not just in antitrust, pure antitrust terms, but in a more, you know, uh, political um, sense in terms also um, of impact on democracy. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's significant pressure to do something. Uh, it's somewhat unclear <laughs> what that something should be, but obviously the agencies are trying to um, appear more proactive. Um, the European Commission has been much more active in this area than the FTC and DOJ. Um, it's obviously a different process in Europe, and so it's somewhat easier for the European Commission to take enforcement action with respect to conduct, um, anti-competitive conduct. Uh, that is more di much more difficult in the U.S., and you know, the last big case that was litigated was the Microsoft case in the in the late 90s, uh, Section 2 case, a monopolization case. Those cases are very difficult in the U.S. So I don't know that we'll see a big increase in terms of, um, of conduct cases, litigation of, of, of conduct cases. Um, an area where I think uh, we will see more scrutiny and potentially more enforcement um, uh, with respect to big tech companies is mergers. Um, you know, there have been calls to uh, break up uh, past mergers, um, you know, the acquisition of Instagram by Facebook, the acquisition of Waze by, by Google. Um, now, you know, litigating for the agencies to litigate past cases and try to break up companies, um, that's tough. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. Those were mergers that were reviewed by the agencies and cleared by the agencies. Um, but I think going forward, in terms of review and, 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 and clearance of uh, mergers in the, in the high-tech industry, we can, we can expect much more scrutiny. Um, and, and probably we'll see the agencies explore um, new theories, um, you know, potential competition, nascent competition. Of course, if you look at the, at the acquisition of Instagram by Facebook, there wasn't really an actual competition theory at that time, also because Instagram was, was so small in terms of, of revenues. Um, but, but you could see an argument um, made by the um, antitrust agencies that, well, you know, the target is small now, not much of a competitor, but it could become a much bigger competitor in the future. Of course, you know, it's, it's, 
it's got to be, you know, you've got to convince a court. <laughs> you right. know, you, the, again, the agencies are not going to have the last word on that. But I think I wouldn't be surprised if we see some of that. I think there's there's been a general view in the tech industry that, you know, very uh, dynamic industry and um, there's competition for the market as opposed to competition in the market. Even if a company gets most of the market, there will be new companies coming in and if they have a better, new, better product, they'll displace the incumbent. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot of criticism of that. You know, some people saying we haven't seen a lot of that um, in the past, um, in the past, you know, decade. You know, Google's been big for a long time. <laughs> Facebook has been big, it's been big for a long time. And um, and then the other argument is, well, you know, that mechanism works well if those new competitors or competitive threats are allowed to emerge. But if you let the incumbents buy them, then that mechanism is not going to work. So I think you know, with um, with a lot of pressure, and you know, you've you've seen the antitrust manifesto by you know Senator Warren talking right. about breaking up a bunch of uh, past mergers. Um, you know, with 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 um, with that pressure, I think I'd be surprised if we don't see some action in the in the. Uh, merger area in the uh, high tech industry in the future. Right, but you know, so if you look at what's happened with Google recently, for example, and I think they just got hit with a fine for a billion seven or so in Europe, and before that there were a couple other fines for a billion or two. These amounts now, while they seem significant mm -hmm. on their face, um, in the eyes of investors, um, they're very inconsequential given the market, the large market cap, right? That seems to be. Uh, growing by the year, and uh, probably in the boardroom, probably inconsequential compared to the earnings power of these companies. They just keep doing what they are doing best, right? Um, what do you expect to come of this? I mean, aside from a fine here or there, any real conduct remedies you can see being imposed and or defended in the U.S.? Well, so the European Commission has tried to impose conduct remedies, to change, um, you know, uh, the business model in certain areas, um, you know, uh, with Google, for example, um, in a pretty significant way, um, although I'm not sure the impact on, on you know, earnings power and, and revenue um, is, is dramatic, but they have tried. Um, obviously, in the U.S., that is much more difficult. Again, the European Commission, you know, they conduct investigation make a decision, impose the fines, impose conduct remedies, and then, you know, they have to worry about judicial review later, and usually that takes several years. Um, in the U.S., it's a very different system for the DOJ or the FTC to try to impose significant changes in terms of um, a company's business model. They've got to go to court. And so, you know, if you think about the Microsoft case in the late 90s, uh, the DOJ litigated the case and then ultimately they settled but you know it's it's a much more significant endeavor for the US agencies and you know of course it all depends on what the court ultimately thinks so i think the threat in the US is much more limited than than in Europe. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't expect any you know section 2 monopolization cases in the US but those are really more rare than what we see in the merger in the merger space, and um, and so you know, I think uh, although there is some concern about you know potential potential attempts to break up companies, I think uh, you know the risk is is probably pretty limited. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your thoughts, Franco. It's Jed Goldfarb for Capital Forum. Franco Castelli, uh, Wachtell Lipton. Nice for, chatting with you. Today. Thank you.